Roughly 2,000 years ago, there was this group of people who came down from the temple complex, and they went out into a field, and they gathered up a sheaf of grain, barley or maybe wheat, something that they'd been doing every year for hundreds of years, I guess, several hundred years. And when they cut that sheaf <coughs> from the earth, there was a man <coughs> who had been laying in a tomb, dead, no more than 72 hours before that, <coughs> opened his eyes when that happened. He folded up his grave clothes, or what they had him bound in. He laid them neatly in a pile, <clears throat> and he walked through a solid stone <clears throat> wall, a spirit bend. He was no longer as just the, like that wheat they cut. He was no longer tied to this earth for his life or his next breath. He was a spirit man. And what those people were doing, well, the next day they took this wheat and the next day they took it to the priest and, of course, threshed it out. And the next morning the priest waved this wheat before the Lord, as it says, for us. At that time, I believe, that's when Christ went to be accepted of the Father for us. <clears throat> and what these people were doing ritually, what it represented, they had no idea that it was happening in reality, in real time, just a short distance from where they were. And that started something. <clears throat> that started a harvest Jesus is called the firstborn among many brethren. He is called the first of the first fruits. So this started a harvest. One man. Now in my, all of my years striving to follow and serve God, I've heard many good sermons about Pentecost and, and all the holy days. And for the most part, they were all good sermons. And I personally believe we should address what is hand, at hand. Do meet in due season, they say. Well, tomorrow is the day of Pentecost. And that's what I'd like to address today, even though it's not fully come until tomorrow. <clears throat> I've heard ministers explain how Pentecost represented the receiving of the Holy Spirit. And that's true, it does. That's well and good. I've given sermons on that myself. I've heard ministers explain how you are to count 50 days from the days of unleavened bread and come up with tomorrow, the day of Pentecost. That was explained in fine detail. And that's well and good as well. We should know these things. We should learn these things. I've heard a lot of good sermons on, about Pentecost and all of God's holy days. But each year, <clears throat> you, you seem to, if you're like me, you seem to learn a little more about each one of them as you go through them. <clears throat> and you can't totally separate God's holy days. Just as Christ speaks of himself and the Father in John 10.38, and in chapter 14 of John, in verse 10 as well, where it says, The Father is in me, and I in him. I in him, and him in me. And then in John 17, 20, Christ says he not only prayed for the disciples, but for the ones who believed through their word. That we all become one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you that they also may be one in us. <clears throat> we are all separate. 
but yet we are connected together, just like the Father and Jesus Christ. They're separate, but they have one purpose and one mind as to what they're attempting to do. We all have different personalities, personalities, but by the Holy Spirit we are all connecting. And we make up the entire body of Christ or the church. It's the same with the holy days. The days that God commands us to observe. They are separate somewhat, yet you have to have them all to spell out God's plan of salvation. Separate somewhat, but they have to all be connected together. And a good example is that of this is, you know, I've mentioned this before, is Passover and the Day of Atonement. We are atoned by the blood of Christ, who is our Passover sacrifice. The Day of Atonement wouldn't mean anything unless Christ shed his blood on Passover, would it? Wouldn't mean anything. For sin which leads to eternal death, cannot be forgiven unless there's a shedding of blood. In other words, someone or something has to die in your place for you to be redeemed from the curse of the law, which is eternal death. And I don't know if I fully understand that, but it's got to be that way. I don't know why there has to be blood shed, but God says that's the way it has to be done. But it's not just Passover and Atonement. You will find that all the holy days are like that. All are connected in spelling out God's plan of salvation. <clears throat> Let's go back to the book of Acts. And uh, I'll not to get, try to get too involved in what it says here. But uh, in Acts 2 and 1, 1 through 20, I'm not going to read all this. But, you know, I'll paraphrase. You know, we see a great miracle of God performed on the day of Pentecost. We see this great manifestation of the Holy Spirit in action. We see the power of the Holy Spirit giving the apostles the ability to speak in other languages of which they had never spoken before. And they themselves understood what they were saying as well as the people they spoke to. Now, <clears throat> it would truly be a miracle if someone who was of Spanish descent or German or French came through the door back there and all of a sudden, sudden began explaining and I began to explain the scripture to them in their own tongue. <laughs> that would be a miracle. Even though I'd never been schooled in their particular language whatsoever, but that's what the apostles did. And by the way, some people accuse me of not even being able to speak English. But, you know, but, <clears throat> and they're probably right. Now, in no way do I want to diminish this great miracle which was performed on Pentecost. It has significance, and it has important meaning to it. But, you know, it doesn't really tell you what the day itself is all about, does it? As Mr. Smith said. You know, the word Pentecost simply means to count 50. And that's what we do to come up with tomorrow. We count from the days of unleavened bread, and these 50 days come up to tomorrow. <clears throat> and I'll also leave that for another time as well. The word Pentecost is Greek, is a Greek word. The apostles themselves probably did not refer to the day as the day of Pentecost. To truly understand this day and its true meaning, you have to go back to the Old Testament and see what the name Christ himself gave it. And Mr. Smith mentioned this. It is called the Feast of First Fruits, And that's where we see the explanation of what it's all about. So let's go back to Exodus and see if we can, Exodus 23, and see if we can get a feel for what is meant here. Let's start in verse 14. It says, Three times you shall keep a feast to two men of the year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread, and you shall eat unleavened bread seven days. And then on down in verse 16, it says, In the feast of harvest, or Pentecost, the first fruits of your labor, which you have sown in the field, 
the fe and the feast of in gathering, which is tabernacles. <coughs> Now, we know there are more than three holy days, but it's only talking about three in this passage of Scripture here. We see three holy days listed here. They're distinct somewhat, yet all of them represent a harvest of some sort or some kind. And it has always amazed me that God has based his plan, great plan of salvation, on food. <laughs> That's what he's based it on. Because food is what we all understand. Food is what we, we all know that we have to have in order to exist physically. Of course, it's the Holy Spirit, which is represented by tomorrow also, is what we have to have to live eternally. Chapter 34 and 22 basically says the same thing, I, I think. Yes, it says, and you shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. <clears throat> so here we see it called the feast of weeks, because the seven weeks we count from the harvest of the first of the first fruits until tomorrow. Actually, all this grain they harvest in a seven week period is called the first fruits as opposed to the harvest at the end of the year, which is the harvest to come later, which would be, again, as Mr. Smith said, it'd be called the second fruits, I guess, since this is termed the first fruits. Otherwise, it would be just be called the feast of fruits, period. The word first fruits of itself makes a distinction between two different harvests. There are the first fruits, and then there are other fruits which will come later. Now, the word second fruits is not in the Bible, but neither is the word second resurrection. But we believe in one, don't we? We know that there is one, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. <clears throat> but if there is a first, then of necessity there must be at least one more. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been assigned a number, and hopefully we all understand that. Okay, let's... Let that thing staple together. Let's start in verse 10 here in Leviticus 23. Let me get back there. Leviticus 23:10 says, "Speaking to the children of Israel." And say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the firstfruits of your harvest unto the priest. And that's what I was talking about a while ago. They took this sheaf of the very first ripe grain, and they waved it before God, or they presented it before God. And this sheaf, of course, represented Christ, which is the first of the firstfruits, to be accepted of the Father on our behalf. Because notice in verse 11 there, as I've already mentioned, it said, it shall be waved, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. That's us, folks. So we can see here, this also ties the Passover in with the Feast of Pentecost, or first fruits. These days God commands us to observe all somehow tied together in God's plan of salvation. Distinct somewhat, yet they are, they are all related to the same cause. <clears throat> and notice it says it shall be offered on the day after the Sabbath, which is Sunday. You start counting on a Sunday, and when you come to that 50th today, it will also, also be on a Sunday. It can't be any other way. And that will be tomorrow. I've heard some people say Pentecost can come on any day of the week. My advice to those people is to go and learn how to count. Because if you start on a Sunday, you will wind up on a Sunday. <clears throat> now remember, from the end of the days of unleavened bread, the next seven weeks of the wheat harvest is called the harvest of first fruits. That's what it's called. <clears throat> now 
Now, some people say, no, that's wrong. Well, let us consider some good old common sense. Sowing or planting wheat is no different than sowing or planting anything else. Been raised on a farm, I've had my share of experience in such matters. I know for certain you don't plant all of any grain at one time unless you're raising a very small amount. So evidently, neither does God. Because if you do in the physical sense, you're in big trouble. And I've also mentioned this before. Grace and Irene and I planted a bunch of corn one year. Sweet corn. We put out about 12 rows <laughs> at one time. And it ain't all came in at one time. And we gave it away. We processed all we could. We told people to come and get it. And, of course, there were those people who said they'd take some if we'd bring it to them, you know, also. But uh, it nearly killed us to try to process all that corn that year before it ruined and went bad. But we learned a lesson that year. And now we plant maybe two rows. Next week we'll plant two more. Next week, we'll plant two more. That way, it doesn't all come in at one time. It doesn't have to be harvested all at the same time. And it doesn't work us to death trying to process it or freeze it or whatever the case may be. We stagger it out so we have a longer harvest of the crop. That's what they did when they raised wheat. They had seven weeks of grain harvest. It, didn't get ri all, it all didn't get ripe at the same time which brings us up to tomorrow. Roughly half of the growing season, <clears throat> there's a so-called spring season, which runs into the summer. Then there's a fall season, which runs up into the wintertime. Now, I don't know if that's true in all parts of the world, but Christ was speaking to the people in all... He was addressing the people who lived in and around Judea, at that time. Now, most of us here today live a little north of the parallel of those in Judea. I don't know if you've ever thought about that or not. Our winters are a little colder than theirs. The parallel of which Judea is on is also the same parallel of that of South Georgia and southern Alabama. You may have never thought about that. So their winters would normally be warmer than, a little warmer than those of us here today. So from the time you plant a crop until it is harvested, combining the so-called spring harvest and the fall harvest together, God has given us 12 months which to accomplish this. Now that may fall strange on some people's ears who doesn't understand agricultural practices. But in order to have ripe grain at the end of the days of unleavened bread for this wave sheaf offering, which starts out this harvest up to the day of Pentecost, you have to plant the wheat in what we call December. It is called red winter wheat. And that's the best kind that makes the best flour for bread. And by the time Pentecost rolls around, you'll spend about six months in sowing and reaping the entire harvest. But not hardly a full six months. Why? Because God said, he would cut things short. If he did not, mankind would completely destroy himself and there would be nothing for him to harvest. If mankind were to keep on going the way we are today without God's intervention, uh, <coughs> mankind would completely ob obliterate himself off from the face of the earth. In other words, if the harvest is not harvested at the right time, if you just continually let it run its course, then it will begin to deteriorate and rot and completely ruin. So God is going to harvest these crops <clears throat> at the right time rather than to let them run their full course and become totally worthless. Over in Matthew 24, 21 and 22, verses 21 and 22. He says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not as since the beginning of the world to this time. 
no, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake. That's us, folks. This harvest, this Pentecost harvest, but for the elect's sakes, those days shall be shortened. This, of course, is talking about the first crop or the first resurrection. Us, the first fruits, and those that were called to be in this first harvest before us. So God is not going to harvest all his family members at once. There's the first fruits. And again, hopefully that's us. Then there's the harvest which comes later, the fall harvest. And I think Mr. Smith mentioned that as well. <clears throat> well, I hope that wasn't too deep for us. I hope we can all understand the analogy. <clears throat> now, it may have seemed that I've digressed from the day of Pentecost itself, but it's important we understand the difference between these harvests of God, that we may strive for the better harvest, which is one of the things which is represented by tomorrow. Now, the calendar we go by, this Roman calendar, is not the same calendar as they went by. <clears throat> but that doesn't matter. You can't change the time and the seasons. You can't change the time that they come and go any more than you can change the time the sun rises and sets. So no matter what some people may say, they have approximately six months to plant and harvest their crops of which is called the first fruits. Now, in the six months, they had another harvest, or the second six months, not of wheat or of only one thing, but a greater harvest and a greater variety of food, or foods, not just grains. They had figs, they had olives to harvest, and there was the grape harvest, Everybody looked forward to that grape, grape harvest. They, they knew what they were going to want to have a stomping, squeezing good time and, and make something wonderful out of that grape juice. It wasn't marmalade either. They looked forward to that wine. Look forward to the wine. And of course, they had other fruits and vegetables and nuts to harvest also. And I've always said that I know without a doubt they had vegetables and nuts because there's always been vegetables and nuts among God's people. So I know they had vegetables and nuts to harvest. <clears throat> I may be one of them. I don't know. I've been accused of it. He's not here today, but there's a certain man that's accused me of that. This harvest is called the Feast of Ingathering of which we, we will be keeping in just a few short months. We know it is by the, feast, by the name of the Feast of Tabernacles or the second harvest of the year, the second harvest of God's people at the end of the millennium. Now, I gave a sermonette a while back on the parables of Christ and how in his parables he used physical things in the physical world to represent the spiritual things we need to be learning as his disciples. A lot of times he used agriculture to explain these things to us. He used agriculture to explain spiritual culture to us. He used the very basics of things to explain the spiritual world. And somehow we still have a hard time comprehending it. You know, vegetables and nuts, <laughs> we have a hard time comprehending these things. Now, I don't mean to be repetitious, but let's go back to Leviticus 23, if you're still there, and look at this harvest of physical fruits or grain and apply it spiritually. And maybe we can get a better understanding and appreciation of the magnitude of what tomorrow represents. So let's go back and start again. Leviticus 23. And let's see. Well, we've already read that, 23.10, about how they went out and took this sheaf. You know, the time sequence here is at the end of the days of unleavened bread. And some of this wheat, which they had planted back in what we call December, was beginning to get ripe. <clears throat> and down in verse 14, 
We see they were not to eat any of this new crop themselves until they first made another wave sheaf offering to God. Verse 11. And you shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. That's for you and I. And, well, let's, let's read some of this. It says, and you sh verse 12, And you shall offer the day, that day when you wave the sheaf, and he lamb without blemish of first year for a burnt, office, burnt office, offering, I'm sorry, unto the Lord. Now notice also this lamb was to be offered along with this sheaf of grain. He was to be a perfect lamb, a lamb without blemish. So this offering of the first of the grain and this perfect lamb represents Christ being offered as a sacrifice for our sins and our redemption to God. And to think that the Father and the Son put all this analogy together thousands of years ago to represent what the Son would have to go through physically for this rotten world, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. That should humble us, humble us as God's people and make us have a deeper affection and respect for our Creator that they put all this magnificent plan together. Verse 15, 16 here, it says, And you shall count, I'm coming on down to this here, and you shall count unto you from the tomorrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Even until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days, and you shall offer a new food offering unto the Lord. And tomorrow is the end of those seven Sabbaths. And as we can see, we are, we are to offer an offering tomorrow. We will be taking up an offering tomorrow. Now, notice verse 17 here. You shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves of two tenths deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall, they shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now, Jesus was the first of the first fruits. He's talking about the rest of us here. <clears throat> it says these loaves are to be baked with leaven. They are not unleavened as the bread we ate during the Passover and on the days of unleavened bread. This bread has leaven in it. That unleavened bread that we ate represented the body of Christ. But this bread has leaven in it. And it says this bread represents us. So what does that, this suggest? If unleavened bread represents the absence of sin in Christ, would not leaven bread suggest the presence of sin in us? And if so, that tells me God's people, no matter how hard they try, <clears throat> and let me emphasize, we, we should certainly try, but as physical human beings, we will never be totally without sin. And that's the reason we should strive harder to become a spirit being in God's family. We should strive to be among these first fruits of God. Now, all through the Bible, it alludes to the fact which true Christians should strive for perfection. But the fact is, we can never become perfect in this physical world. So why would it even suggest such a thing? The physical world is not perfect, my friends. It can't be for nothing physical. No matter what it is, it's perfect. Nothing in this world is perfect. I found out a long time ago that woman I married wasn't perfect. I thought she was, but it didn't turn out that way. Nothing in this world is perfect. <laughs> Even I'm not perfect, no matter what you think about me. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. The point being, perfection can only exist in the spiritual world. <clears throat> and we also know there is imperfection even in the spiritual world. We understand that by the existence of Satan. Now, he was created perfect when he was created, but how he, he chose to degrade himself 
to the state of imperfection. Roman 8, 21 tells us, at this point in time, the whole creation is in the bondage of corruption or imperfection. This world, people, is not real, no matter what you think about it. It is the spiritual world which is true reality. It's not this world. And you can only achieve true perfection in that spiritual world. Yet, we are to strive for that perfection while we are still physical, looking for the time when our change will come and perfection can be achieved. But notice something else here. We've already seen the first wave sheaf offering being offered along with the lamb without blemish, representing Christ, of course. And that has been offered for us before the Father, offered as the first of the first fruits. Now, it says these loaves representing us uh, it says these loaves here are to be offered as an offering. Well, who are we to be offered for? Christ was offered before the Father for us. Who are we to be offered for? Verse 20 here says these two loaves of bread, which represent us, the first fruits, will also be waved before God or presented before God. <clears throat> In the physical here, they are to be holy loaves of bread for the priest or for the office which the priest holds. In the spiritual, we, us, these loaves of bread are to be offered before God also for the office of the priest. Christ was offered that he might obtain the office of the priest. We also will be offered that we might obtain the offices of kings and priests under him. Revelation 1.6 and, and Revelation 5.10, you know, shows us that, that God can take sinful people, people with leaven, and make them into something pure and spiritual, people like us. I'm not going to turn there. If you want to jot that down, you can. It can be done by the power of God, which is why our salvation is a free gift. It can never be obtained by keeping the physical laws themselves. But that's not to say we don't have to keep them, for it's only those people who are keeping God's laws that will be considered considered candidates for God's free gift. In verse 17, it says, here in Leviticus 23, it says, these loaves of bread are to be baked with fine flour. How do you obtain fine flour? Well, you sift it. You sift out the chaff. You get out all the little pieces and the stems. And you get rid of all the trash and all the junk in it. And that shows us that we should also begin to sift our own lives, to get rid of all the junk and bad habits we possess if we truly want to become the first fruits and have a part of restoring beauty and tranquility to this earth and to the universe. You know, The grain offering, that wave sheaf offering, which represented Christ, was whole grain. Didn't need to be refined. But the grain representing us does. We have to be ground. We have to be sifted. And we have to be put through the fire and baked. You know, God puts us through all of this to try us. He, he lets us go through trials to be tried. So we have to be ground and sifted and baked. Only bread which is made of fine flour can become one of these loaves which are represented or presented, I'm sorry, before God. Only bread made from this flour can become a first fruit. And you know, sometimes I feel God is sifting his people today. He's sifting his flour today. 
Well, we see these seven weeks of harvest here. If the wave sheaf represents Christ being presented to the Father after his resurrection, and I for one believe that, then these seven weeks also represent the time period of God sifting out those who are to become God beings like himself in his kingdom. He has seven weeks of harvest to choose who those people will, will be shortly before the t time Christ returns to this earth. However, our time won't come until what is represented by the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. But tomorrow is the day that points to all this. This time is also represented in the parable of the ten, virgin, ten virgins. It is a time God is seen who is wisely using their oil, or that is the Holy Spirit, and who are not. Romans 8, 29 tells us our destiny, along with Christ, is to be the firstborn among many brethren. We have the opportunity to get in on the ground floor, so to speak, of becoming God beings and becoming rulers in God's kingdom. And that, that should motivate us people to become a true follower of God. And that should motivate us to use the Holy Spirit He has given us. And if you don't use God's Holy Spirit, then no amount of preaching from anyone can help you. James 1 and 18 James 1 and 18 tells his, his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be the first fruits of his creatures, or the first fruits of the rest of the people who he will call in the feast of ingathering, or at the, at the end of Christ's rule of 1,000 years. And 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23 says this, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But every man in his order, Christ, the first fruits, or rather the first of the first fruits, then afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. And then on, over in Romans 8, 1 through 23, and I'm not going to take time to read all this word for word, so I'll paraphrase here a little bit too. Romans 8 and verse 1, Paul says, There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk after the Spirit. That is, if you're trying to do right and follow God, God is not going to condemn you to eternal death if you make a mistake as long as you truly repent before him. In verse 2, he says, The Holy Spirit of God has made him free from the law of sin and death. And a lot of people will jump on that and say, Aha, we're free from doing any of the physical laws. As long as we accept Jesus as our Savior, we're free from keeping the laws of God. Do anything we want to do. Don't have to keep the law. Christ did it for us. And it, but in verse 3, it basically says only that keeping the laws of themselves could not make it possible for you to be forgiven of sin. Rather, it took Jesus uh, coming to this earth, being sacrificed and spilling his blood in order to make that possible. It doesn't say you don't have to keep them, only that they couldn't do it for you by and of themselves. It took the sacrifice of Christ conjointly with them to make that possible. This is the only way the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. This is the only way we could ever have the opportunity to become first fruits in the God's kingdom. And in verse 8, it tells us plainly, those in the flesh, you know, people, that is, people who have been carried along by every wind of Satan, cannot please God. But we are not, it says, of the flesh. We are not of the flesh, he says, but rather we have the Spirit of God in us. 
And in verse 12, he says, we are not debtors to this way of life. We are not obligated to live like the rest of the world, people. But we are obligated to live by the ways of God. And in verse 14, God tells us, if we allow ourselves to be led by His Spirit, <clears throat> then He already considers us His son, and His daughters, or His children. Verse 16 says, The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. Now, that don't mean you can't jump ship, but God is not going to condemn you to eternal death if you make a mistake now and then, if you truly repent. Through Christ, He has made a way for us to repent and be forgiven. Verse 17, If children then were to become Heirs, join heirs with Christ, and we'll be glorified together with Him. And verse 19 tells us the whole creation is earnestly waiting for us, the first fruits of God, to become manifest to be, or to be born into the kingdom of God. Now, why is this? Verse 21 and 22. It is so the whole creation can be freed from the corruption of bondage into the liberty of the children of God. This whole creation is be going to be given into our hands as first fruits to be reworked and to make it into something productive. Now you can go out at night and you can look up at all those billions and billions of stars. And of course there's billions more that we can't see. All of those dead, dead planets, they're waiting for us, folks. They're waiting for us. And I've lost another page of notes, folks. I'm getting famous for that. Oh, well. So, however, what does tomorrow represent? It represents our presentation before the Father as living spirit beings, sons of the Most High, brothers and sisters to Christ Himself, being God, God beings ourselves, having rulership of the entire universe, all over, all over those, all of those dead planets out there. But until that time, what are you and I to do? What are we to do? And does what we do make a difference in other people's lives? Let's go to Matthew, Matthew 9. Matthew 9, verse, start verse 35. It says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray you therefore the Lord, to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into the harvest. The harvest is out there, folks. It's out there. But he seems to be saying here there is never enough labors to take all the harvest in. There's never enough people there. In Luke, over in Luke 9, 57, okay, Luke 9, 
starting in verse 57. It says, And it came to pass that as they went on their way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me to go and uh, bury, bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead. <laughs> but go you and preach the kingdom of God. This, this is instructions to us as well, people. And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So he's telling us here of all the things in this world that we need to do or we think we have to do, we must be dedicated first and foremost to the work of God or this harvest of the first fruits, first and foremost. The second harvest will come later. Let's go on over into John, John 4. John 4 and verse 31. Start in verse 31. Or, yeah, 431. It says, In the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. They were encouraging Jesus to eat, some, eat something. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Has any man brought him something to eat? Jesus said unto them, My food is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not you, There are yet four months, and then comes harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reaps receives wages and gathers fruit, unto eternal life. And both he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one sows and another reap. I send you to reap that whereon, wherein, or whereon you bestowed no labor. I send you to reap where you have bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you are entered into their labors. So, we can also see that you and I are here because someone labored before us. Someone labored in that harvest before us. It is now our job to carry on that labor that others, as we did, come into the truth of the Scriptures and that they might gain their eternal salvation as well. Let's go on over to John 9. Starting in verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, Neither has sinned. Neither has this man sinned, nor his parents, but that, uh, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is yet day. The night comes when no man can work. So, Jesus is telling us here that there's a time coming, folks, when we will no longer be able to work. So we must be fervent now while there is time. Now, and over in Amos 11, 11, I'm not going to turn there, but it also tells us the days will come when the Lord will send a famine in the land, not a food of water, but of the hearing of the word of God. So we should feel an urgency to be out there in this harvest while there is time. Let's 
Let's go to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians nine. Let me see. First Corinthians nine, starting in verse eighteen. <laughs> Paul says, "What is my reward then? Truly, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge." Well, that's what we try to do too. We give. We preach the truth and the gospel without charge. He said that I abuse not my power in the gospel. <laughs> For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but rather the law unto Christ, that I may gain them that are without law. And that's a discussion, that's a sermonette all in itself there. <laughs> but I'll not get into that. He said, to the weak became I as the weak, that I may gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I may have might by all means save some. Now, Paul knew he of himself could save no one. He, he knew that he could not grant eternal life to anyone. Paul knew that. But he knew what he did made a difference as to whether some made it or didn't make it. He knew he was a laborer in the harvest. And that's what we all are. We're laborers in that harvest as well. And yes, folks, what we do does make a difference, believe it or not, as to whether some people will make it and some don't. One last verse, Revelation 14. Revelation 14, starting in verse 1 said, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having the Father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping on their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn the song but the hundred and forty-four thousand, which are redeemed from the earth. These are, it says, these are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which followed the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. So, I leave you with a question that you can only answer in your own minds. Do you really and truly understand what being a first fruit is, what tomorrow represents, and the magnitude of what it represents, and the importance of striving to be a first fruit? Do you really get it? Do you really understand? And furthermore, do you really want it? Because if God has called you and you're striving for it, it's there for you to have.